All right. Talk about meringue, baby. <laughs> no, it doesn't work as well. Today we are talking all things meringue and how to master it. There's lots to know about meringue and it is such a valuable tool in so many baking recipes. You're gonna see it folded into cake batters. You're gonna see it used as the base of frostings. You're gonna to wanna to put it on pies. It can be on its own as cookies or pavlova. There are so many recipes that call for meringue and there are so many ways that it can kind of go awry. So we're gonna talk about all of it today and you're gonna to learn to master it. So let's get with it. Before we talk about all the different kinds of meringue and start to break those down, first I want to give you some visual indicators for some of the common phrases and terms that are used in meringue recipes. So the first is frothy, and that happens when you start to mix on a low speed and it, the eggs just start to break up and there are visible bubbles inside the mixing bowl. Frothy. So this is what I would call foamy. When you're mixing, you can see that down below, the color of the egg whites hasn't completely changed yet. It just has sort of a layer of white foam on the surface. This is a soft meringue, a soft peak. And you know because when you dip the whisk into the meringue, and you lift it out, that it does hold its shape, but it slumps right on over and sort of starts to fall back on itself. So that is a soft peak. This is a medium peak. It's strong enough to hold its shape, and it does slouch over a little, but not so much that it's kind of falling back onto itself like a soft peak. This is stiff peaks. And this is a good application when you're gonna use the meringue right away, it doesn't get any more mixing, and you want it to fully hold its shape exactly without any slouching over. That's a stiff peak. It's important to start mixing egg whites on lower speed because that starts to loosen them up. It loosens up the protein that is the structure of the egg so that they can reform into stronger bonds with air incorporated inside. So you're first starting on a lower speed to break up the eggs and get them to that frothy stage. Then you can raise the speed and really whip them for the volume and to get that height and that glossy, white, fluffy meringue. Meringue powder is dehydrated egg whites, sometimes with added stabilizers and or sweeteners. It's dry and shelf stable, so there's no separating eggs or risk of rogue yolks. Two teaspoons of meringue powder plus one tablespoon water equals one large egg white. So let's get started by making the simplest meringue, which is the French meringue or common meringue. One of the biggest problems with meringue starts before you even begin whipping, and it's right here with your equipment. Meringue does not work if there is any remnant of grease, fat, really anything going on in your bowl. So if you're somebody that, like me, is using their mixer all the time, washing it all the time, you might be okay without doing any other additional cleaning to your bowl. But if you're someone whose mixer sits in a cupboard or in the corner and you're not using it so often, be sure to take all the pieces of the mixer off, give them a good scrub, and then wipe them down with some white vinegar. That acid will help ensure that it's really, really clean, and also acid is a helpful tool in making meringue rather than a harmful one like fat or grease is. So you can just run it over the tines of your whisk, run it over the bowl, make sure anything that's gonna touch that egg white mixture is grease-free and free of any impurities before you begin. That is the first key to meringue success. The second comes when it's time to separate your eggs. And there are a lot of different methods for separating eggs. When it comes to meringue, it's really, really, really important that you don't get even a hint of yolk in it. So for that reason, I often like to separate them with my hand because it's a little, little more gentle. I just crack the egg and a lot of people separate an egg like this, taking the yolk back and forth with the shell. 
and, and that works. But because the edges of the shell are kind of pointy, you risk running into breaking that yolk just with the edge of the shell. So I like to hold it in my hands like this. And again, you wanna make sure your hands are totally clean so that if you have any butter or anything going on in your hands, that could be problematic. So you wanna make sure you're using this with clean, clean, clean hands and just gently separate the white from the yolk. You can save the yolks for other purposes. People ask me all the time what to use when you're making a lot of meringue. What do I use all those yolks for? And my number one answer is puddings or ice cream, homemade ice cream. It's a great way to use up egg yolks. When you separate eggs, they also have this like kind of piece. It's what attaches the yolk to the white. And I don't actually know exactly how to pronounce it. I think it's kalazi, spelled in a complicating way. But that portion sometimes will stay with the yolk and sometimes will stay with the white. Don't be concerned if it's in with the white. It isn't gonna cause a problem. However, if you're really finicky and you want an even smoother texture or consistency, you can strain your egg whites to remove that little bit of protein and it's what bonds the yolk to the white and that's one one of the things that you're removing when you separate but sometimes some of it will end up in the white just like i have here it's not a problem you can still continue so i'm going to add this to my mixer bowl because we are going to make the french meringue or common meringue which is the easiest kind of meringue because it doesn't involve any additional cooking or heating it's really just whipping egg whites with sugar i'm adding cream of tartar to my egg whites before I begin. This is really important because it helps to stabilize the meringue. Eggs naturally contain sulfur, and sulfur can sort of break down the bonds that are trapping those air bubbles inside the meringue. So cream of tartar, really, it's an acid and it helps to stabilize the meringue by reducing that sulfur activity. However, if you don't have cream of tartar, a little bit of lemon juice or a little bit of white vinegar, some sort of neutral vinegar will produce a similar result. But it really is an important thing to add, so don't be tempted to leave that acid out. I'm gonna start mixing it on low speed, and then I'm going to gradually increase the speed to medium high once the mixture gets frothy. Once the mixture is frothy, that's when you're gonna raise the speed to medium high and start adding the sugar. All right, so we're gonna gradually start adding one cup of granulated sugar. If you have super fine sugar, that's especially great to use in a French or common meringue. Once all the sugar is added, keep whipping on medium high speed until you reach your desired peaks. All right, this one is perfect. Woo! It's my favorite thing to do with the meringue. Yes! Meringue, it's a beautiful thing. So this is all that a French meringue is. It's just eggs whipped with some sugar. What you're gonna use this for primarily is when the meringue is going to be baked. So because the eggs haven't been cooked or heated in any way, this really isn't safe to eat raw on its own. I use this kind of meringue when I'm making meringue cookies or often when I'm gonna fold it into a cake batter. Those are the primary situations that I'm gonna use it when it still has plans for the oven later. The common problems with a French meringue are grittiness. Because the sugar isn't heated in any way, sometimes it doesn't dissolve by just whipping alone. So that's something you have to keep an eye out for as you're whipping. And what helps is either using super fine sugar or just continuing to whip at a slightly higher speed, encouraging that sugar to dissolve by the time that you get to your desired peaks. My favorite thing to do with a French meringue is to make crispy meringue cookies. Sometimes I swirl them with a little bit of jam or caramel sauce. So that's what we're gonna make with this French meringue. Next up is a Swiss meringue. A Swiss meringue is one of the first where you actually heat the egg and sugar. So the sugar dissolves, which is really helpful, but also the egg is heated to a point where it is safe to cook. So we're gonna start by separating our eggs. Cold eggs tend to separate better than room temperature eggs. 
but room temperature egg whites tend to whip up a little bit better. So you can always kind of separate your eggs and then leave them to come to room temperature for a while. Just when they're already at room temperature, it can be difficult to separate them without the yolk wanting to get in on the fun. And when you're separating eggs, be really gentle. Like I just broke a yolk, okay? I see that it's broken, but because it's in my hand, I can cradle it and prevent it from dropping in there. And I may have lost a little bit of white there, but that's preferable to getting any into my egg white. But now I wanna wash my hand because the yolk broke in my hand so that I can have clean hands before I touch another egg. So just as cold eggs tend to separate better, fresh eggs tend to separate a little better, but older egg whites are rumored to whip up a little bit better to a fuller volume. So, you know, Sometimes when it comes to eggs, it's six of one, half dozen of another. As long as you don't have any yolk, it doesn't really matter if your egg is cold, warm, fresh, or old. We just wanna make sure that we're only dealing with whites. It's also important to remember that you cannot use boxed egg whites to make a meringue. I've had lots of people ask me these questions over the years. I've tried several times. They're just not consistent. Sometimes they never ever whip up. So I don't know what's going on, if there are some little traces of something, but I would never recommend using boxed egg whites. I'm gonna add a quarter teaspoon of cream of tartar to it. Okay, so now we're gonna add our sugar. When I'm making a French meringue, I don't mind measuring with a volume measure because you also have to pour it in gradually into the mixer. But in this case, and with most baking, I really do prefer to measure by weight. So I'm going to add 340 grams, one and three quarter cup granulated sugar into my mixing bowl. Ooh, I got a pour spout, I can just do that. And now we're gonna take this over to the stove where I've got a pot of water that has come to a simmer and we're going to heat it over here. So graceful. So it's really important that your mixing bowl is heat safe. It's also really important that the bottom of your mixing bowl does not touch the water inside the pot. You don't wanna make direct contact. We just wanna be gradually and indirectly heating this until it reaches a temperature where the eggs are safe to eat, which is 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Also during this time, the sugar is gonna dissolve, which is gonna be really useful for mixing it up and making sure we don't have any grit or any problems there. It is important to continue to whisk it while it's over the pot of water because we don't want the eggs to start to cook. If they're not being kind of agitated at any given time, they could start to scramble, especially around the edges of the pot where the heat is really starting to warm up. You wanna keep the heat so that the water is just barely simmering. If lots of steam or gusts of bubbles of boiling water are coming out of the sides, that just means it's heating really, really quickly and it could be uneven. It could start the process of cooking, which we don't want. We were just talking about, did anyone ever make a meringue before a stand mixer? I know that they did, but I can barely whip this on here for too long without getting tired. So how did they do it? They must have taken turns. <sighs> I'm tired already. So you don't need to worry about whipping it quickly. We just need to stir it so that nothing gets cooked. I'm gonna start checking my temperature. Already I can see that the sugar has started to dissolve. It's just over 100 degrees, so we have a ways to go. If you don't have a thermometer, it is possible to do this sort of by eye because when the sugar is fully dissolved, that usually means it's ready to go. There's no single granule left. But if you're not heating or cooking this again, this is the only time the eggs are gonna be cooked. So it is really important that they reach 160 degrees. We're there. So now we'll return our bowl to the standing mixer and we're gonna start whipping it on low speed. Then we'll gradually raise the speed to medium high and keep whipping to our desired peaks. So that is a Swiss meringue. 
And the main advantages of a Swiss meringue are that because it's heated, it can go right onto a finished baked good. So I like to use a Swiss meringue. My favorite way to use it is to put it on top of a pie as pie topping because it's pretty quick to go from the stove to the mixer and then onto the pie. And when I'm putting it on a pie, I like to keep it a little bit more medium, nice and swoopy, get some good movement in there. And it's also really fluffy and delicious to eat. So I don't really like to play favorites, but Italian meringue is my go-to. It's my the one I make the most. I use it for frostings. I use it really all over the place. So let's make it as the final, final meringue lesson. I'm gonna crack my eggs again for large eggs. Sometimes when you're making a recipe that calls for a lot of yolks, like you're making a custard or ice cream, anything in that vein. You might be wondering, well, what am I gonna do with all these whites? I don't wanna make a meringue today. So in, you can freeze whites. They freeze really beautifully and they freeze well for several months just in an airtight storage container and just thaw them before you're ready to use. And it's so nice then to have a big baking project and not have to separate any eggs. Sort of the nice replacement since you can't use boxed whites from the store. Meringues are really easy to add different flavors to. You can beat in a little bit of extract at the end of making a meringue, citrus zest, some spices, really anything to add a little bit of flavor, even cocoa powder, you can sort of fold that in gently at the end. But uh, Italian meringue, one of the reasons I love it so much is that you have your eggs ready to whip and you cook your sugar on the stove top to a certain heat and then you add it to the whites while they're whipping. The heat of the sugar syrup is what's gonna cook the eggs to make them safe to eat. And it just makes a really beautiful, smooth, lovely meringue that I really love a whole lot. And uh, I really love Italian meringue because you can use other sweeteners the most easily in this particular recipe. So if you wanted to use honey for some of the sugar or molasses, you could really use those easily in the syrup application because you're cooking to a certain temperature. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my egg whites into the bowl along with my quarter teaspoon cream of tartar. Now, I'm going to measure my sugar. And for that, I need my handy dandy scale. I'm gonna measure 340 grams granulated sugar. And we're also going to add some water, three quarters of a cup of water. This is gonna help the sugar dissolve and start to form a syrup inside as we heat it. It's a little bit easier to cook sugar while it's dissolving in a little bit of liquid than it is to just cook sugar dry in a pot. So I'm gonna come over here to my stove and I'm gonna put it on medium heat. I'm gonna stir it for the first few minutes to help the mixture combine and to encourage the sugar to dissolve. This is one of the scariest things about Italian meringue for most people is that it involves cooking sugar on the stove, which sounds really terrifying. It's honestly as simple as bringing it to a boil and just waiting for it to hit a number. But there are a few things to look for. So the first thing is I'm gonna stir it until it comes to a simmer. The moment I see bubbles, you're gonna stop stirring. I had a great pastry chef in school who used the phrase, agitation promotes crystallization. So when you stir something that's already cooking, that has sugar in it, it wants to go back to its original state, its crystalline state, as little sugar granules. And you don't want that. You don't want a gritty sugar syrup. We're just gonna heat it until it starts to bubble. And after that, we stop touching it. And we just let it do its thing. So if you wanted to add an alternative sugar, like molasses or honey, you could replace a portion of the sugar right here in this stage. It's difficult to do that in some of the other meringue preparations because they're sort of relying on the granules of the sugar to help it aerate and to help those that air become incorporated and trap the air bubbles inside the structure of the egg as it whips. So I particularly like that about this meringue because you're already melting the sugar into a syrup anyway. You're already dissolving it, so it's a good time. I like to make a molasses meringue on top of a sweet potato pie, delicious. We did a honey meringue on a cranberry pie once to die for. So there's really a lot of options to get creative. And that's really the case in so much of baking. There are so many opportunities to play with it and get a little 
tweak thrown in to make it your own. Okay, so now that our mixture is coming to a boil, I have to do one very important step, and this is where a lot of people get scared or kind of go awry. There's little tiny sugar granules around the outside of the pot, and I'm just dipping this brush in water and brushing them away to dissolve them and push them back into the pot. And if there's any sign of those crystals left behind, the whole mixture wants to turn back into a crystal and it'll just get hard and grainy, no good. Once all the sugar crystals have been washed away from the sides, now we just need to let this mixture cook until it reads 230 degrees on our thermometer. The actual temperature that we're trying to reach is 240, but we wanna start our egg whites whipping when it gets to 230 so that they are already nice and frothy when we get to adding the sugar. So we're already at 230. I'm gonna go ahead and start mixing my whites. All right, 240, the magic temp. So we'll bring this over. With the mixer running, we're going to start adding the sugar syrup in a slow, steady stream. I'm gonna to try to add it right at the edge of the bowl so that it goes down the side. If you get it too close to the whip, the sugar syrup can hit the whip and start to kind of whip around the outside of the bowl rather than becoming incorporated into the egg whites. That is an Italian meringue, my favorite. So like I said, I love to use Italian meringue to make frostings, but I really use it in a lot of applications. I'll even use it as a pie or cake topping, use it as a frosting all on its own. And I especially love to toast Italian meringue. One of the main problems or things that can go wrong with Italian meringue is over or undercooking your sugar syrup. If you undercook it, it may actually be too liquid. It might have too much water in it and it's just not going to end up the same result. You may end up with sort of a runny meringue. And if it's too firm, it's actually going to harden up inside your meringue and make kind of chunks of sugar, which is no good. So you do wanna be careful. It's a good time to have a thermometer on hand so that you can be at the exact right temperature, but it's as easy as bringing it to a boil and then adding it to your mixer. So let's throw this onto a cake. Good. <laughs> Should we torch it? I love fire. Can't stop, won't stop lighting things on fire. Okay. It's done. Okay, we finally did it. I finally made a mistake. So the most common question I get about meringue is in regards to weeping. Weeping is a problem that happens when meringue is exposed to moisture or when it is mixed improperly. So we have two examples to show you what it looks like and I'm gonna talk a little about how to avoid it. First up, we have our meringue cookies. And these meringue cookies, because they have some jam swirled in, they have moisture in them. So we stored them improperly. We put them into the refrigerator and you can see this meringue cookie right here is starting to weep moisture. Basically what's happening is it's deteriorating and it's becoming sticky and wet on the outside here. Another thing that can cause weeping is not mixing your meringue properly. So when the meringue is visibly granular, there's granules of sugar that haven't dissolved, haven't been incorporated, then it's just waiting for weeping to happen. And this can happen in a lot of ways, but usually because sugar is hygroscopic, it absorbs moisture from the things around it. So it just starts to absorb moisture from the air, from anywhere in the immediate vicinity. And you can see right here, this meringue is still quite firm to the touch, but over here, this meringue is so soft that it's weeping and actually deteriorating to the point of becoming soft again. 
What causes weeping at the end of the day is exposure to moisture, which can also happen with temperature changes or humidity, and also the improper mixing of a meringue so that the granules of sugar are still inside. And in either one of those cases, you might have weeping. Okay. So this is one of the things that can happen when you over whip a meringue. Instead of being shiny and glossy and smooth and holding kind of these sleek peaks, it gets dry and clumpy and it's not shiny. It's very matte in appearance. So you can see the clumps also forming around the lower part of the whisk. So it's aerated and it is gonna add volume to your recipe, but it's not gonna have that same shine, that same sheen. So that's a sign of over whipping. Okay, so here I have some of my meringue cookies that I baked in the oven. And when you bake meringue, it's really important to bake them at a lower temperature because you're not just really baking them, you're more drying them out. And that gives them a crisp exterior and a marshmallowy soft interior that is so, so delicious. And that's what we made with our French meringue because that hadn't been cooked or heated at all, so it really wouldn't be safe to eat unless we baked it. Now on this side, I have my toasted meringue meringue on top of my cake, and this is the Italian meringue. The Italian meringue was already fully cooked, so the toasting is really just for the caramelized flavor, the beautiful effect, but it is important to know that just toasting the exterior does not fully cook the meringue, so you can't make a French meringue and toast it and think it's gonna be 100% safe to eat. Now, my favorite torch is this big boy right here. And I love it so much, I just buy it at the hardware store. And the whole set, the head, and the canister of propane is about $20 at a standard hardware store. You can also buy things like this in a kitchen supply store. They're much smaller, and they're a little bit more expensive and a little more finicky. And I just love this. I love torching meringue and toasting things and just generally love fire. When you use the torch, you just turn it on. You hold it close enough to the cake that it starts to toast it, but you don't want to hold it so close that it turns black or even ignites. It is possible for the meringue, especially little pointy ends, to actually light on fire. And the level that you toast it is really up to your own personal preference. See, I like a nice, dark, caramelly, beautiful toast on my meringue. The third way to cook meringue is to put it under the broiler. Again, this is something that you would usually want to do with a Swiss or Italian meringue because you're only putting it in the oven for a brief time. I find that baking the meringue on a component, like trying to toast it under the broiler, is very difficult. The combination of a cool or room temperature item with the cool or room temperature meringue, then you've got the hot oven. It is just a recipe. The temperature change is a recipe for making weeping happen. So when you have all those temperature changes going in and out of the oven, it can be a little bit problematic. So I prefer to toast with a torch because it just makes an easier result and does not promote weeping. So now you have all the tools and all the knowledge you need to master meringue. And you can make loftier cakes and smoother frostings and toasty effects and the crispy marshmallowy cookies, really anything you want. I can't wait to see what you make with your meringue now that you've learned to master it. Be sure to show me your creations on Instagram. And if you like this video, be sure to, oh, I did it again. Dang it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> You can find all these delicious recipes on Food52. And be sure if you enjoy this video to like and subscribe. Join me next time. Happy baking.